Welcome to Hacker Rank Radio, episode number 12. I'm Gaurav Varma, SVP of Customer Success here at Hacker Rank. This week, we're bringing you a conversation I had with Paul Hill, Senior Director of Software Engineering at Bazaar Voice, at our flagship event, Hacker Rank Maine. Paul and I dove into some of the most challenging aspects of technical recruiting today, from building your brand in a new city to building your candidate pipeline. Paul shares some great insight from the perspective we don't always get to hear, which is from the engineering side. Paul Hill, currently with Bizarre Voice and uh, site lead in Belfast. My undergrad is computer science. been in computers since for actually 14, I think, is when I first got introduced to him. As site lead, I'm kind of just responsible for all aspects, recruiting, offers, culture. It's extremely diverse responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Let's switch gears, Paul. You're the one who created the, the first team in Belfast, right? You started building out the team. The first team was built out in Austin, which is headquarters for Bizarre Voice. Uh, and then you took on this endeavor of saying, I'm going to build a team from, from scratch. Probably very different experiences, Austin, Texas versus Belfast. Tell us more about that experience and the differences in, in building teams in two completely different geos. Yeah, so the one thing about Austin when I joined five and a half years ago is that they already had an established brand. So mm -hmm. it's not like they had to really work at building a brand in Austin. So coming to Belfast, there was nothing, right? No brand. And if you know, I don't know how much people know about Belfast, but there's a very close-knit group and the technical area is even more so. It is not uncommon to run into three or four people, you know, just walking down the street that are in the exact same field as you. So it was very important to start off right and avoid going wrong when it came to building the brand. Me personally being involved, have, having the computer science background, talking about the technology, having been at Bizarre Voice three years at that time, had a good experience across the different parts of the organization. So I don't think I ever talked about recruiting mm -hmm. at any, you know, any of the like meetups. And initially that was not intentional. It's just I forgot because I get excited about tech and I start talking about tech and I forget about, oh, oh yeah, by the way, I'm recruiting too. So the first seven folks we hired was very... I didn't realize I was going to be a salesperson. And that's really what I was doing. I was mm -hmm. selling the brand, the culture around all the things that have been said so far. What are the technical challenges? I didn't give a crap about the languages. <laughs> I controlled my language there. <laughs> I didn't care about the languages that anyone knew. In fact, the first five folks, there were two that the only Java background they had was maybe a class in university, maybe. Mm -hmm. It was ignore that and just figure out, can they solve problems? Are really they willing to learn? And that flexibility on my part enabled me to attract people that wouldn't have normally even considered applying. One of the first groups that we got connected with, well, DevOps was the first, but then the second group was the women who code. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of the fact we have 23% of our staff is women. It's awesome. I had to approach things differently for them. A lot of them wouldn't even apply because, well, it's really hard. I don't know if I can make it. And so I had to do a lot of convincing just to get them to take the Hacker Inc. exercise. And in some cases, I couldn't even do that. So I had to get them in to actually write code on a whiteboard because they, they were really scared of it, but super successful with it. That has enabled me to build a great brand in Belfast, well-respected, at least that's what I hear. <laughs> and now we actually had a a young lady, a developer who got the in-person interview with us and quit her job the same day that we told her she had an in-person interview. She hadn't even interviewed with us yet, but yeah. she was that good, that confident, and wanted to work with us that much that she chose to do that. So That's excellent. We need a lot more of those, right? Yes. Absolutely. That's great. When you and I talked, and you've mentioned this before, which was very profound because we at Hacker Inc., and it starts from Vivek, has a very similar, like we have the same philosophy, but you said candidates are not resources, right? And this is something that we all have sort of starting with Vivek and he installed this is people are not resources. In the context that you talked about it was candidates are not resources and it's really important that the candidate and the company sort of the, the alignment and, and that relationship is really important. And so candidate experience has always been top of mind for you. Yeah. Tell us more about that philosophy and how that's worked and, and what are the things that you've done as you scaled up this team around the candidate experience? So Belfast has to had to adapt some, and we've had to adapt some. So if you go to Austin, the typical uh, software engineer interview starts around 9 and finishes around 4. So it's a, a solid 
Workday. I think there's seven interviews in that. And in Belfast, the typical interview is a lunch hour interview spread out. You know, you'll know, you do one today and then maybe one in two weeks mm-hmm. and then another one uh, a couple weeks after that. So it'll take a month or so or even two months before you finally get to a point where, okay, we're ready to make an offer. Well, that's too slow from my perspective. <laughs> so I had questions initially with the first group of folks we hired, like, hey, can you change that? And, and I'm like, no, we're, we're going to do the same thing because we need to see you're in a SaaS. When things get broke, you've got to fix them. And it doesn't matter what time of day or night or whatever. Mm-hmm. So we've got to be able to assess someone under pressure. And so we made those kind of shifts and we went from seven hours to four hours. But by using Hacker Rank, that four hours, it's still technical focus, but we also need to focus on culture. There was a comment, I remember, who said, like, skill's the most important thing. I don't agree with that. It is very important. Mm -hmm. But if they don't fit, it doesn't matter how good the skills are from a culture perspective. So we've had to adjust some little things like that because Austin is a very close-knit technical community. It was very similar in Belfast, very Mm -hmm. close-knit technical community. So taking the similar approach of understanding that if we do something wrong, take the wrong approach to diversity or culture or treating people like things instead of people, Mm -hmm. it will spread and we will fail. And recognizing that they're in control in reality. If they're good, they can get a job anywhere. They're in control. I've got to realize I'm giving up control here. All I'm trying to do is, are they a fit with us? Are we a fit with them? And then come to an agreement on how much to pay them. <laughs> yeah, I, I struggled with that one. Even in the Valley, trying to like customer success, hiring for customer success. Yeah, I'm not in control. They've got plenty of options uh, to go to. And that's tough, right? Giving up control. Hung asked Lindsay and Bradley two questions, and I'm going to want your perspective from the other side. The first one being your tech brand, right? And, and both of them shared a lot of insight on developing a tech brand, how important it is, and what approaches that they're taking would love to get your perspective. You know, it's a massive shift in in what's working, what's not working. So around the pipeline, one of the things I learned in Belfast is it's never too early. It struck me as odd that there's a lot of focus on primary school and getting involved. PwC has a program there that kind of Dragon's Den approach where you get the kids pitching technology projects and things like that. Hmm. And it struck me in there, my daughter is in Gen Z or whatever, yeah. and she just finished her master's degree. But it, it struck me that I remember when she was 12 and she was interested in what I was doing and what I did and the company I worked for and things like that. And it's like, okay, it isn't too early at 12 mm-hmm. years old to get them interested in technology and get involved as a company, you know, representing the company in events like this with the kids. Because in five years... They're 17 and they're either looking to go to university or they're looking for an apprenticeship or they've already been coding for five years. Right. Right. And they're probably ready to go in terms of they could come in and start making an impact at the job in terms of developing the brand. So from scratch, it was basically everything you said, getting out there, talking about the technology and the Mm -hmm. challenges. The one thing is a lot of folks don't know who Bizarre Voice is, what we do. We are the largest provider of ratings reviews in the world. Mm -hmm. No one's close. I mean, we've got over a billion reviews in our system. 1 billion, so big B, I think it's like 1.1 billion right now. We see over a billion users' devices on a monthly basis. That uh, gives me goosebumps, but it also right. gives the developers well, goosebumps absolutely. when I talk about that to right. them. And that's, that's, that's all I have to do to sell it is just talk about the technical challenges, the scale that we have to work with, the fact that no one knows us and is like, well, that's kind of cool that no one really knows us because you're operating at scale like Google and Amazon and mm-hmm. Netflix and having the same problems and challenges. And when faced with that, it's like, I really want to work on that. So being flexible has really been important, especially with moms. I have had two candidates, one man and one woman, who applied because we put part-time positions out there. But when we talked to them, it's like the gentleman wanted to work on an open source project one day a week. Okay, you don't need to work part-time for that. Take your day and go work on your open source project. The lady had two kids that needed to pick up her kids twice a week and leave the office at 2.30. Her former previous company, you have to be part-time to do that. Why? Uh, Yeah, wow. (laughs) That's nuts. (laughs) So they're both full-time employees, but that reputation spreads... And that just that part-time listing just spread widely within the women and code community, and we got applicants because of that. So, There's so many elements to your tech brand, right? It's not just what language is, what problems you're solving, but this is a multifaceted thing that we need to approach. 
Let's move to the, the last question, and I want to give some time to everyone in the audience to ask you questions as well as folks in the live stream. That recruiting and engineering, while we are partners, there's also we think differently. How do you work together? Do you have a C-level executive who's driving this top down versus its grassroots efforts? From your perspective, when you're on the on that table with your recruiting team, are you seeing alignment or are you seeing dissonance? And then how how are you handling that? And what's your advice to everyone in the room is how should they be approaching? My philosophy on software engineering is quality first. I think it's in the long term, that's the least expensive way of approaching it. So my philosophy in recruiting is quality first. I don't care about the volume. I care about the end result and having the best quality software engineers. I would say my recruiter and I are almost always on the same page with that. It's actually us arguing with, hey, you're not going fast enough. You're not hiring enough. I think my target was 55 engineers by the end of our fiscal year, which was one May. And I had, including the placement students, which are absolutely outstanding, I had 49. It's like success yeah. to me. Right. But from sea level, it's like, well, we need to look at another location because you're not hiring fast enough. Okay. I mean, what are we talking hiring fast enough? A hundred a month? Five a month, right. and so when it comes to quality, by far, they're the best engineering team I've ever worked with. I don't fight battles for them. My product team does because these are the best engineers I've ever worked with. They're the most collaborative engineering team I've ever worked with. Like, okay, I don't have to say anything. So long-winded way of saying we're on the same page. The way we did it is like when a recruiter joined, we just sat down every single day went through recs, went through candidates, went through job descriptions. She was learning about the company. She was mm -hmm. learning about the technology and how to recruit the talent for Bizarre Voice. And now I don't do much with her because she handles it all. Not all of it, but works closely with the different hiring managers to handle the hiring. They've got a great working relationship, and uh, it's been because she's been on the same page with us from early on. That's so. awesome to hear. Definitely. I want to make sure that we have enough time questions from the audience and then folks on the live stream. So please, I'm sure you're, you want to know a lot more about from the engineering side of the house or your business partners. What would you like to hear more from? I was just you know? wondering about asking someone to do a one hour test prior to a sort of a strong application engagement in the process. How's the feedback been on that? So we have three views on candidates. So we have applicants sourced and referrals. We never on sourced and referrals, give them a test first. <laughs> it's always engagement with at least a recruiter or a hiring manager first. And then as part of that, we describe whoever was describing the problem, talking about telling them what the process was. We tell them, here's the process that we go through, which includes this technical screen using HackerRank. With applicants, it depends on how many. So like our placement applications, those tend to be in the hundred or so range. Mm -hmm. So we don't talk to them first. We basically send them the mass email with the Hacker Inc. exercise. Those that complete it, look at the results. And those that don't, then we give them, I think, 14 days or something like that, um, or one renewal of the, the link. And then we send them a, well, we don't even send them a note in that case. They, they basically disengage. So. So we, we looked at it as the different types. So we don't just automatically give them the right exercise first. We find that a lot with our customers when you're, it's volume or someone's applying. Even having that as sort of a apply here and there's a go take the test. And even in the instructions for the test, give them more visibility on once you take the test, what can you expect the next step to be? Like how quickly before you respond to them. And they will take it, right? So especially when you're applying on your careers page, is just have like a apply here button and take the test you will see the, a higher acceptance rate for wanting to, to spend the hour. The other piece that's really important is based on the role that you're hiring for is the content or the questions that you're asking, are they relevant and are they contextually relevant? So someone that's a little bit more senior, you know, five plus years of work experience or even two to five years of work experience, if we design assessments which are more textbook, straight out of college, I have to go remember, this is what I did, this algorithm that I don't remember anymore, I don't use it every day, I have to go crack open a book, then there's, do I need to go put in the effort to do this versus let me give you something that's more real world. And so one of the examples that Odette was showing is bring something from your own code base. It's an opportunity to sell to the candidates as well, even if they're just applying or they're getting sourced and saying, here's the type of problem you're going to be solving. Go solve this and experience it. And then that we will see a much higher acceptance rate from them. So there's lots of different approaches and techniques. And depending on the source, how they're coming to you, 
the experience level, there's sort of different workflows that work really well. And we tend to try to pick questions that are related problems that we've solved right. versus mm-hmm. creating our own problems. Um, sure. So it, we have this problem. Let's find something that's similar. Similar, to for sure. So. Yeah, there's a big library for you, for you to start right. from. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Yes, sir. You mentioned about the uh, mum returners and how you almost had to persuade them to take tests and, and kind of engage in the in the process. Just curious as to how you started those conversations with them in the first place, where you were finding them, and yeah, how you kind of uh, worked on that diversity and inclusion piece. So it's not it wasn't just moms; it was just basically okay. women, regardless. Okay. And there were almost always referrals. I can't think of any that were the one that quit her job first, then then did the interview. She she was a referral, but she obviously was very outgoing in terms of taking chances and taking risks in that. The other ones, very early on, July 13th of 2017, we did a Women Who Code talk on Kanban and culture and that. And out of that, we got one person that was interested. When we hired her, then she kept connecting us through that community. And so that's basically has created this series of referrals. I think there's only one, I think only one of the women was not a referral. I think all the other ones were referral of some sort. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering if you kind of did any personalized outreach. I don't know if you help your recruiter with kind of... Getting, basically getting involved in everything women in tech community, whether Thank it's you. Lean In, Women in Tech, Women in Who Code, Women Tech Maker. You know, I sponsor them because I do have a lot of folks that already participate there. They give me a heads up when events are coming up. And it doesn't cost a lot of money, right? I mean, I meet up maybe 250 pounds or something like that for pizza and drinks and things like that. So the main thing I really push for, and this is women in TechMaker, you know, they wanted us to be the platinum sponsors. Like, I'll be the platinum sponsor as long as I get a keynote. Getting somebody up there talking about our tech and our culture and that is the key to expanding the brand. And if I can at least get them one-on-one or two-on-one where I can get them talking about their experience, I can maybe get them over the hurdle of taking that technical exercise. At least one of them was so nervous that I basically did a whiteboard with her. And I was like, I think you should just interview with us. And she did. And we made her an offer. And she joined us a few months later. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time and your insight. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions, tweet us at HackerRank.